Hi, hello. Thank you for coming to my talk, Maslow's Particle System. It's going to be a little bit about Abraham Maslow, pictured here, and a lot about particle systems. You probably know Abraham Maslow from his number one smash hit, The Hierarchy of Needs, but he also has this absolute banger, Maslow's Hammer, also sometimes called The Law of the Instrument. Uh, you've probably heard it paraphrased, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But this full quote here is from this book, The Psychology of Science. Uh, it's a truly lovely book in which he uh, makes a kind of a plea to the psychoanalytical community for a more holistic, more humanistic approach to the psycho psychoanalytical project, um, but also to science in general, I think. Uh, and I'm going to read this uh, little excerpt that I think is kind of eerily prescient. I have been disturbed not only by the scientists and the dangers of their denial of human values in science, along with the consequent amoral technologizing of all science, just as dangerous are some of the critics of orthodox science who find it too skeptical, too cool and non-human, and then reject it altogether as a danger to human values. Uh, so that is a very lofty and philosophical introduction to what is really going to be a pretty silly uh, talk about uh, using particle systems as a way of um, getting uh, very high performant, very um, natural feeling interfaces, uh, and also hopefully um, bringing some joy to your users. Uh, so this is me. Uh, my name is Matt Hayes. Uh, you can find me as Mystery Command on the internet pretty much everywhere. My pronouns are he, him, and the slides will be available online and the repository for all the code that we're gonna look at will also be available online. So uh, let's look at uh, the, so this is my little sort of chatbot messenger app. I can uh, type a message here and it shows up. I can tell it to say hello and it will say hello back. I can say B movie and it will begin reciting the B movie one line at a time every two seconds. Uh, now I'm just going to use this to sort of fill the window with some messages. Uh, I can also say congrats and I get this cool fireworks uh, particle effect. Uh, and then uh, if I send it some love, I get this other cool sort of sentiment, you know, like what you would see if you're live streaming a, a Facebook event or something like that. I wasn't really sure what to call it. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here is that this uh, scrolling uh, window of messages is its own kind of particle system where uh, I'm using the bounds of the window to filter messages that get shown or not. This is sometimes referred to as virtualization or windowing, um, but uh, modeling it as a particle system uh, gives us a pretty uh, efficient and like easy to reason about way uh, of approaching the problem. Um, so that's what we're going to build. That's what we're going to sort of tour. And uh, just get back to my slides here. Nice. A uh, little bit of history about this talk. The reason that I took inspiration from Maslow's Hammer uh, is sort of a little self-criticism. Uh, I've been thinking about particle systems and using and reusing them since sometime around 2007, 2008. Uh, I saw Seb Lee Delisle give uh, this talk, AS3 Particles 1000% Extra Free, uh, at I think it was Flash Belt in 2008. Uh, I was uh, recently out of art school and uh, had found my way into the advertising world and was building a lot of uh, banner ads and microsites and looking for ways to uh, add pop and pizzazz. Uh, and this was really uh, inspirational to me, just as like a kind of clean, clear, concise way of organizing the problem. Uh, the first implementation I ever did uh, was an action script class called Bedazzler, and uh, what it would do is uh, take a color and uh, a time duration, and it would just sort of scan the Flash movie for pixels of that color, and then 
put a little sparkle on them and kind of bedazzle it for a, uh, some uh, silly banneret. Uh, I gave a talk about uh, the similar kinds of things. Uh, this was more sort of canvas based and just looking at how to break up uh, some of the uh, some of the parts of these kinds of systems um, in for, at forward.js in 2016 I was working at Yahoo and then uh, in 2017 I was working at Tumblr and I got the opportunity to give uh, another version of this talk at Liberty.js where I'd had a little bit more sort of practical experience putting some of this stuff to work in some experimental UI uh, for Tumblr in that talk is the first time I really kind of introduce a sort of more practical application. Some of the feedback I got from the first talk was, it's really fun, but uh, I need to like do work. Uh, so in this uh, second iteration, I, uh, uh, I focused a lot on a, a Google developer's article called Complexities of an Infinite Scroller, where I kind of looked at it as a one-dimensional particle system. Uh, and that uh, same kind of, uh, the inspiration from that is also in this uh, this app that we're gonna tour. Uh, and then late last year, uh, actually after the Liberty JS talk, uh, some feedback I got was, uh, I think you're kind of building up towards an entity component system. And that really um, set me off in the direction of entity component systems. Um, Unity, the uh, game engine, uh, came out with a thing called Project Tiny and a thing called Dots, or the data-oriented tech stack, uh, which are both entity component system kind of rewrites of, uh, of some of the core uh, framework functionality with the goal of uh, doing higher performance work and uh, also being able to sort of dynamically scale it down to what uh, mobile devices can handle or like a web browser. Uh, being able to launch Unity games as WebGL apps on your uh, on your device. So uh, we're going to use some patterns here. The first is just a handful of interfaces. Uh, the the main one being the the particle, right? Uh, I'm going to use uh, Verlet integration. If you've ever like looked into physics of any kind, uh, it's just a way of modeling uh, physical behavior without uh, needing to track uh, velocity and acceleration. So you you wind up mostly doing addition and subtraction, so it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, it's not quite as realistic as uh, Euler or semi-implicit Euler, but it is um, cheap and very stable. So uh, it makes it a good candidate for, for these kinds of like fun silly particle systems. Because it's uh, using vectors for position and previous position, we know the VEC interface. And uh, the field here is a little bit hand wavy. What I really need is some kind of like world state or global context. Uh, there are sort of conditions under which you want to emit a new particle, uh, and conditions under which you want to sort of deactivate or, or clean one up. And uh, those generally depend on some sort of world context. You might in some other implementations see this described as a world or as a universe or as global state. Then we have an object pool and a property initializer. Um, this we will get to sort of midway through the tour of the code, but it is just a, a sort of more memory efficient way of uh, keeping, a, keeping track of a fixed size list of particles and recycling them when we're done instead of sort of just throwing them away and, and letting the garbage collector uh, clean them up. And then um, effects and the command pattern. The command pattern comes from design patterns, the uh, Gang of Four book. In the book, they call it a, a reified method call. They're kind of approaching it from a Java or C++ sort of background. And in JavaScript, all functions are reified. We have these sort of first class functions. So really, the command pattern here is just functions that we're going to pass around callbacks, essentially. Um, so this example is an updater, which is which is basically an implementation of that Verlet integration scheme. We get the current velocity by subtracting the previous position from the current position, and we add the current velocity to the current position the, to the current position to get the next position. We cache the old position and move on. In my actual implementation, there's a sort of a gravity vector that we also add in there. The two other kinds of effects that we're really going to make use of here are a kind of create or activate effect and a, a remove or a deactivate effect. And we'll see that 
in a minute. So let's look at some code. If I check out uh, 1.0, I really just want to uh, show you that this is a pretty vanilla Create React app setup. Uh, I'm using the TypeScript template. Oh, and I am adding some semantic release related stuff just so that I can get these uh, these uh, releases uh, as tags in GitHub and um, I get this nice change log um, that uses my commit messages to uh, sort of move things along. But other than that, it's it's pretty much straight up just a just a React app, right? I, I use the, the component folder pattern, CSS modules, but really nothing out of the ordinary in here. So here I'm starting to build out mostly just the interface. Uh, my app has um, a reducer for uh, actions. I, I have this kind of a knit, which is sort of a uh, measure the size of the window, an add message, and then a render message, which also kind of just measures the size of the, the message object itself. Um, and uh, in here you'll see uh, I have this effect which fires whenever it renders, uh, and if we don't already have a top and height for this message, uh, we're going to generate one and render it. And if we do have a top and height for this message, we're going to scroll that message into view. Uh, and I also think at this point that, yeah, in my uh, sort of form, my submit bar here, uh, what I'm doing is just echoing uh, everything I say. So if we look at this, Oops. Here I can say hello. Did I break it? There. Uh, so it's it's got some jank, right? It's early, but uh, you get the kind of basics of the the layout of the interface and uh, kind of what we're uh, going for. In one dot three. You see, I sort of stub out my fireworks effect, but really I just am starting to kind of organize things a little bit better. We've still got this big reducer in the top, but now we have a, a messages component that kind of represents the window. Uh, and here, uh, here you see the actual sort of uh, filtering, right? So we have a kind of an update effect that's being called as part of this on scroll event uh, whenever the whenever the messages window scrolls. And we have this kind of cleanup effect happening here, which is just really just this uh, messages.reduce that filters out messages that, are, that have been rendered but are now outside of the window's uh, bounds. So moving on, if I go to uh, 1.4, you can see where uh, I am implementing this um, fireworks thing. So here I have uh, a new state uh, key called is showing fireworks and it just conditionally renders this fireworks component. The fireworks component, if we look all the way down at the render, is a canvas. And if we just quickly look at the CSS, uh, it starts out at opacity zero and has an opacity transition of 0.4 seconds or 400 milliseconds. Uh, that's going to come in handy for uh, transitioning in and out when we um, render this uh, fireworks thing. Yeah, so there's an effect that fires the first time it renders, right? It's got no dependencies. It just gets a ref, uh, it just grabs the, the canvas ref uh, and then creates a state variable for the rendering context. Uh, it also does some measurement and width stuff and then sets the opacity to one. So uh, 0.4 seconds after it's rendered, it is fully opaque. Uh, and then this effect um, fires when the context changes uh, and it really sets up our uh, frame handler. So we just kind of step through this. Uh, we capture the frame ID so that we can cancel it if we unrender for some reason. We do some stuff with time to normalize it. Uh, and then we have an emitter here, uh, which just pushes onto a particles array. Uh, then we have uh, kind of some uh, context set up. We have an updater, which we'll look at is, uh, is just the, the, the Verlay integration thing I described earlier, uh, and a renderer, which takes the context and the particle. Uh, and then finally, we have this reducer, which just resets the, the particle 
is a kind of mutable array at this point by filtering out anything that's outside of the bounds. Um, so if we scroll up, it's all just in this one kind of uh, module at this point. Uh, here you see our Beck and particle interfaces, um, props for the component. I'm pulling some stuff off the window just to shorthand it. This character here uh, you can get with option P. Uh, it's great. I love it. Here's our particles array. Uh, this is pre-object pool optimization. It's just a list. We have some um, some configuration state here, uh, a p function which generates a new particle or emits a new particle, uh, some vector mass stuff, uh, an updater which is the Verlet integration thing I described, and a render call which draws them into the canvas context. If we look at that, uh, do I say congrats? Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I think this is sort of as far as I can push it with the performance characteristics we have. As you'll probably note here, we're just creating new objects every time, uh, and we're in the sort of create emit sort of step. We're just uh, pushing them onto this list, and then we're pushing the ones we want to keep onto a new list and throwing the whole list and, and everything we didn't want to keep away. So we're creating a lot of references. We're creating a lot of objects that the potential for garbage collection is uh, very high at this point, but forward. Uh, yeah, so in 1.5, I add a similar kind of a sentiment. Again, I didn't wasn't really sure what to call it. Uh, and it's very similar to the uh, fireworks display. Uh, I guess let's look at this too, because we just uh, made some updates. So, uh, so here I've moved some of the interface stuff out into a little lib folder so I can focus on just the sparks and particle effect here. I, P has become create spark, uh, and I have an update spark and a render spark, and then I moved these um, create many kind of functions uh, into their own functions. Uh, but it's, it's pretty much just like moving it out of, uh, out of being in line in, in the frame callback. So, uh, so yeah, here you see the kind of setup. Uh, here is the create, render, and remove. Some optimizations, right, that are kind of obvious at this point is uh, that each of these uh, uh, do something with many calls is is iterating over a list uh, every frame. In fact, uh, the render sparks is uh, iterating over the entire list, and then and then we're reducing over the entire list in the very next um, call. And if we look at the sentiment thing, that lets us um, get that heart effect. Uh, it's a very similar setup, right? It's a lot of uh, copy-paste, but we have sort of unique uh, opacity and scale properties on the on the heart. We don't have a render heart here because we're just going to set visible hearts as state and then let uh, let React do the uh, do the diffing and the rendering. Uh, and so we can check that out here. trying to uh, overwhelm so this sort of uh, limited in terms of the number of particles the effect uh, and um, uh, the performance I if if we sort of throttled this up very much from where it is uh, you would see uh, significant amounts of sort of jank and, and lag in the system whenever the garbage collector kicks in. Uh, so let's see if we can clean that up here. Let's look back at our, our fireworks uh, here. So now uh, inside of our frame handler, we have a single sparks dot for each. So we're only going to loop over the list of sparks once. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if we are uh, looking at a spark that is currently not active and we should emit we will do the kind of activating uh, step, and otherwise we'll bail early. Uh, and then we do, this is kind of the new deactivator or the remover step. And if we've deactivated a spark in this step, we're just going to return so that we avoid the update and render steps. 
Uh, and kind of similarly in the sentiment thing, we're just going to uh, loop once over all of the hearts uh, and bail as early as possible throughout. And I think also at this point, yeah, we have the pool. So uh, if I go back here, I've moved uh, the particles out to their own module, so they kind of have their own domain. Uh, so you see here we have the hearts are a pool of heart interfaces. Uh, there is a fixed number of 50. Uh, they get their UUID once at the beginning and just kind of preset their values. And then the activate and update step are really what kind of like uh, um, resets them at the beginning. Uh, you know, if they're if they're sort of moved out of the frame, they get become uh, inactive and eligible for uh, re redrawing. And then the update step adds gravity uh, and moves everything along. A similar setup in the fireworks display uh, with the addition of render, right? We pass the context in and we draw it. Uh, an optimization here is to use fillrect. It's a little bit cheaper than uh, ellipse and fill. And we'll talk about some further optimizations that could be had there uh, at the end. Is there any other? Uh, I guess the other, only other really significant change here is that uh, the reducer is kind of moved up into its own module and it is uh, just um, setting and, uh, and, and adding uh, items in the state and we actually have a, a wrapped dispatch callback that handles the sort of special cases for us so that we can have that all in one place. So again, uh, you'll see if I do congrats here, we get like a lot more particles and uh, we can do a lot more hearts at the same time. And it's pretty smooth. Yeah. If I get a bunch of stuff in there, then I do congrats and then I do the heart and then I scroll. You see, we're not getting too much jank at all. And I'm running a screen recorder. So this is like a lot going on and uh, it's um, highly amenable to kind of tuning to whatever performance characteristics you might be targeting. So I think uh, 1.7 is where I add the uh, B movie enhancement uh, and I'm actually, I, I fixed a couple bugs this morning. So let me check out my extra credit branch. Uh, and now we're, uh, we're back at the kind of full, uh, full featured app. Uh, and we get, you know, pretty solid performance uh, with just a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, organizing our code in, in a sort of uh, set of uh, particle system-like patterns. Okay, back to slides. We are almost done. So where to go from here? As I mentioned, uh, we're creating a lot of vectors. Uh, those uh, vector math operations are uh, immutable, so they're returning completely new vector objects uh, every time they're run. Uh, it might be an optimization to create a pool of vectors and do a kind of similar activate, deactivate sort of thing. Uh, an optimization I've made in previous incarnations of this, uh, of this presentation, which is kind of overkill for um, what we're doing here, is a fixed time step. A uh, fixed time step would let you split the update and the render steps from each other, make it so that the update step can kind of uh, play catch up if the render step takes too long. Uh, which means that the animation is smooth even if the rendering is not. Yeah, you can ask me more about that if you have questions. Uh, another thing that would be really interesting to me to explore and I'm still kind of working on is message passing and how you do kind of interactivity and events uh, in, in, a, in a system like this, especially as it broadens out into an entity component system. High level overview of what an entity component system means is if we're thinking about particles as kind of rows in a in a table uh, like one column is uh, the x position one column is the y position one column is previous x previous y active uh, and so on an entity component system would be a way of organizing the code so you're dealing with columns and kind of running 
almost like queries on this uh, database of particles to get a certain set of like columnar records. And it is, um, it is uh, very uh, efficient from a memory layout standpoint. Might be, might be neat to explore in uh, this sort of virtual machine that JavaScript gives us. Also, I think this is functional. You might have noticed that a couple of uh, instances were passing a particle instance and like some extra um, state along, uh, whether it's the field or the rendering context. Uh, that is starting to feel to me like this reader monad pattern. Uh, functional programming is very new to me. As I mentioned, I came from art school, so I have a pretty non-traditional path into engineering. But one really exciting possibility is that if you have a functional system that is associative and closed over composition, it is parallelizable, and maybe we could push all these particles into multiple workers and just have them emit sort of uh, operations or positional updates or do something like that to, you know, run potentially, you know, 10 times more or something like that. Uh, and then similarly, on the rendering side, right, where the real expense there is the draw calls, um, thinking specifically of the, um, the fireworks display, it would be a cool optimization if we could batch all of the particles of one color, draw all their rectangles, and then fill one time. I think that's it. And finally, Black Lives Matter. It would be weird and uh, maybe even irresponsible to start a talk with uh, the humanization of science and uh, Abraham Maslow and not in these unprecedented times mention that Black Lives Matter. Uh, if you find yourself thinking, please keep politics out of JavaScript, uh, I have to say that uh, silence is also a form of political speech uh, and that inaction is action. Um, in the off chance that me talking about it is the thing that pushes you over the edge into action, the Equal Justice Initiative seems great and they accept recurring contributions so you can set up a, a monthly donation. A Black Lives Matter card uh, and Black Lives Matters card uh, are both great, highly circulated, just in case you haven't seen them. This Twitter thread uh, from Victoria Alexander uh, is a sort of anti-racist reading list uh, broken up into beginner, intermediate, special topics, biographies. I mean, it's just a, a, a stupendous list there. I've read some of those books and uh, they really uh, moved me and uh, I added all the rest of them to my reading list. On a more personal note, this dismantlingracism.org has a page on white supremacy culture. Uh, if you, uh, like me, grew up in an almost exclusively white community, maybe rural or suburban, uh, maybe in the Midwest, and remember wondering, well, what's, what's my culture? I, I regret to inform you that there is a strong chance that at least part of your culture uh, is white supremacy culture. Uh, and I highly encourage you to do some soul searching about that. And finally, um, if you're into indie games, Humble Bundle is doing a fight for racial justice bundle. 100% of proceeds go to some great charities. Uh, I have no affiliation with Humble Bundle whatsoever. I just like indie games and think it would be cool if we lived in a just society. That is my time. My name is Matt Hayes. Here are the slides. Here's the repo. If there is anything I can do, I mean, I kind of only know JavaScript, but uh, if I can review your code or make some kind of connection for you, uh, I'm happy to try and help. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the conference. I hope you're having a great one.